Tech team, will you please have one more microphone? Okay, that's, that's fine, thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, once again. Um, and on this panel, we'll be talking about success in sports as a vehicle toward uh, financial literacy. Uh, joined on stage by Kai and uh, Kaven. Maybe I can start with you, Kai. You want to briefly introduce yourself as well as what you do at Limited Ventures? Yeah, can I, can I do one switch it up? Is this on? Yeah, it's on. Is it on? All mm -hmm. right. I actually want to switch it up a little bit. Everybody, we've been sitting all day. Can everybody stand up? Everybody stand up. <laughs> everybody stand up. So I want, I want everybody to close their eyes. Close your eyes. Don't lose your balance. Everybody close your eyes. Think about someone important to you that you left to be here today. It could be someone from the past. It could be a child, a loved one. Think about what they mean to your legacy, right? So when we're talking, we're going to talk about legacy, our past, the culture, how it builds into what we're doing today. But the reason I want you all to think of someone is because they are probably associated with your why. They're probably associated with what drives you. And a lot of times, it's people that we grew up with that are close to us that are actually motivating us to be in these rooms, right? So with that being said, everybody can sit down. Just give you a little shake. Just get the blood flowing, right? So I'm, I'm going to start with my bio. Is it cool if I stand or we, <laughs> can I stand? It's cool. It's okay. cool. So I'm originally from Baltimore. My father was actually killed when I was two years old, right? So very humble beginnings. Um, and a lot of us that come from those type of environments, there are a lot of obstacles, challenges that, that face with that, right? So if you told me when I was younger that I would be a venture capitalist working with a bunch of athletes and entertainers, I wouldn't believe you. I always thought I was going to the NBA or the NFL. Right? But I realized, because I was playing against people like him in high school, that there was no chance for people like me. So, <laughs> so I focused on academics. I went to Villanova. I started out at Goldman Sachs on Wall Street. And what I noticed there was that the business people of the world wanted to be like athletes and entertainers, and the athletes and the entertainers wanted to be like business people. But there's a knowledge gap and there's a language barrier. So what I started to do was translate that language by teaching financial literacy before and after work and on the weekends to all of my friends who are athletes and entertainers. So what we started to do was invest with my clients and the, the network that I was building on Wall Street. So myself, a bunch of athletes and entertainers, we were able to invest in the companies like Airbnb, Pinterest, Lyft, Coinbase, DraftKings, et cetera, et cetera. Ended up moving to LA where I ultimately launched my fund now called Limited Ventures where we help a lot of athletes and entertainers invest and launch their own venture funds. Right? So with all of that being said, I'm extremely excited to announce that Kayvon is actually launching his venture fund called Dream Ventures, making him the youngest professional athlete to launch his own venture fund. Congratulations. So with that being said, Kayvon, why don't you, you know, want to pass it to you and just talk a little bit about your story and, and what we're building. Hello. Yeah, so um, I play for the New York Giants. Um, I was recently drafted last year, number five overall. I'm from Los Angeles, California in the United States. Um, I think the biggest thing that, you know, I want to talk about is lack of opportunity, right? Because me being from the inner city of Los Angeles is, is really, you know, you think it's LA, you think it's the United States where we have all this opportunity, but we're kind of neglected from that broad outside world, right? Because of, you know, the circumstances of, you know, the United States. But when you look at it, I, when I got drafted to the New York Giants, it's the same thing in New York. It's the same thing in Africa. It's the same thing in every continent. When you talk about oppression, when you talk about lack of opportunity, when you talk about lack of resources, and then you talk about lack of unity, right? So partnering with Kai, uh, Kai's been a great you know, mentor to me. I'm only 22, so you imagine that. Yeah, be, be, yeah being here today. Yeah. 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 No, but... Um, being here today is definitely a blessing. I want to thank Forrest family. I want to thank everybody, you know, uh, involved in this uh, event. But being so young, I, I had to realize that, you know, I am a dime a dozen and um, the ability that I possess uh, is a blessing. You know, not too many people have this opportunity. 
and now even seeing athletes who do get it, right, because you hear all these stories going into, you know, professional athletes going broke, losing their money, spending it on different things. You ha I had to have a, a mindset that, you know, I was going to be different, you know, and people ask me, like, what, at what point, you know, we see all these billionaires, at what point is enough? You know, like, when is enough money? When is enough that you feel like you're satisfied? And I, the honest truth is when my people are satisfied, right? And, and it'll honestly be never. But, um, yeah, you, you guys can give a round of applause to that. Yeah. <laughs> um, go ahead, I'll let you. I thought you're not dead. Yeah, I'm definitely not dead. First of all, I did not think that I'm older than you. <laughs> I do not believe you guys. I, I cannot be older than the both of you. I just don't believe it. <laughs> but I won't say my age. Okay, so, I mean, Kyle, let's start with you. Um, you're experienced in investment management. You're exposed to a variety of sectors and industries. Why sport? Um, what niche did you identify over and above the fact that you had an emotional attachment to the sport? Yeah, I mean, I think you hit it right on the head at the end, right? Like, so I started out at Goldman Sachs. If anyone has seen Wolf of Wall Street, that's, you know, working 100 hours a week, that's what I was doing. And there's this concept in investing where it talks about modern portfolio theory. I'm not going to bore everyone with, with all of that stuff. But what I noticed was there was nothing in any traditional finance textbook or philosophy that accounted for influence, right? The influence of the culture, the influence of athletes and entertainers, and what that meant in terms of investing into deals, right? So it was kind of this special sauce to where all of my friends, you know, who I knew and who I was close with were athletes and entertainers. And for better or for worse, they were the only people that trusted me to invest their money as a 22-year-old kid coming out of college. Right? So it was kind of that special sauce in the combination of the, you know, the allure and the attention that athletes and entertainers got and merging that with the billionaires of the world and then getting into the same deal flow that they traditionally have. Right? One interesting thing to think about, when you look at the NBA, the National Basketball Association, and the NFL, 80 to 90 percent of both of those leagues historically come from the same 20 to 30 college programs. In venture capital, that same concentration exists, right? So it's an interesting dichotomy. In venture capital, the top 20 to 30 venture capital firms represent 80 to 90 percent of the revenue in the space. So my thought process was, well, can I leverage the collective of 30 or 40 athletes to differentiate myself from any other investor, right? Because ultimately, if you don't have access to these rooms, you don't have access to the best deals. But I had something different because I was bringing 50 athletes and entertainers. And the reality is the founders and the CEOs, they're all fans, right? So I would take a billionaire on the court, sit courtside, go backstage and get his jersey signed for his, for his kid, right? But that actually was giving me access into the best deals. So for me, sports has always kind of had this, um, this intangible impact from an investment standpoint because it allowed me access into a space to where black investors traditionally don't have access at scale. You spoke about, you spoke about a knowledge gap earlier uh, between the investment community or the business community and the sporting community. What sort of challenges have you faced in trying to close that gap? And do you think that you've closed it or you're still on your way? Well, I think the fact that the gap is still open um, is just an opportunity for upside for us, right? So the challenges that I faced was that it's just a completely different language, right? So like we grow up, I listen to hip hop, I play basketball and football, that was my world. But then you get to Wall Street and people are coming from different backgrounds. So when it comes to educating athletes and entertainers who come from humble beginnings more often than not, just like myself, you just have to translate the language. So what I do is I teach the athletes that work with me, I teach them about investing using their sport, right? All you have to do is put it in the language that people understand, right? And I hate this stigma around athletes and entertainers, you know, not being smart, because I guarantee you if you put anyone who says that in, in the room with you and tell them to learn the playbook, they'll have no idea what's going on, right? So it really just comes to actually translating that language, and I spend a lot of time just educating athletes and entertainers. Ultimately, it doesn't matter if you ever put a dollar with me, we, we don't need the money, right? But what's more important is that we can have a community effect, right? Because what happens is the athlete is typically the champion from their community that has this expectation to bring the entire, the, the entire hood with them, right? So now you're in, you have to empower your ecosystem. So how do I create a mindset, right, 
for you to say, okay, I'm not just investing for myself today, I'm investing for my community and my family moving forward. And that's the most important thing that we try to educate athletes and entertainers about. So Kevin, I'm particularly interested in your story. You're 22, um, safe to assume you're starting in your career. And at the same time, obviously you've got liquidity and you're now starting a venture fund. One would want to, you know, wander around focus, you know, how you're balancing uh, that because you need to be, uh, I think, excellent in both endeavors. Um, so so how, how are you uh, working on that? Uh, I hit it, I hit it on, a, on the nose, right? When you talk about the game plan, you talk about what you're going to do, right? And, um, you hear a lot of speakers talk about seeing the vision, seeing the future, and kind of sticking to that plan. Well, for me, I understood that what I wanted to do was a lot bigger than me, and the position I'm in is a lot bigger than me, and I wanted to kind of create that generational wealth for my family and the people after. And I realized that playing sports and being an entertainer can only last so long, right? But using your mental and kind of connecting that and, and bridging that gap between being an entertainer and getting in those rooms like Kai was talking about is, is going to help become that billionaire and, become, and, and be able to accomplish the things I want to do. So the Venture Capital Fund, Starting that was really the first step to unity, right? And when you say unity, unity also breeds courage. So kind of getting, and, and it's an American thing, I guess, because a lot of black, black, black Americans, you know, um, don't believe in each other, right? Where I come from, we don't really unite. We don't buy from each other. It's, it's kind of a, a, a discouraging thing. But now I feel like this venture capital fund is the first step to bringing athletes, like you say, an NFL and NBA entertainers together and realizing that our money is more powerful together. And once we do that with the right investments, the right team and the right knowledge, we'll be able to, you know, at least take over our communities. Yeah, sure. Just, just to add to that, right, like I think there's been this huge wave, at least in the states, of celebrities starting their own venture firms. But what I think is a little bit different about what, what Kayvon and I are building is the simple fact that, number one, we're not just early stage focused, right? We have the ability to look across the startup, the idea, all the way down to the late stage pre-IPO company. Another differentiating factor is that this is an international fund, right? We want to invest in the best companies in Africa. We want to invest in the best companies in the Middle East, right? But we have to, you know, learn from the model that worked in the States, which is we have to co-invest with the biggest and most influential investors here, because ultimately in private markets, the investor, the, the cap table who's already investing holds a lot of weight, especially because, and I actually think that one of the most excuse me for using this word, but one of the most ignorant thing I find about U.S. investors that try to come to Africa is that they actually don't spend time here. You can't just come here and think you can just throw money at stuff. You have to build real relationships, understand the landscape, right? And that's why we're spending time here. We're committed to coming back. Um, but we, we need to connect with people like Julius, who we spoke with earlier, Mo, who was on stage here, so that we can understand the landscape of the continent and, and co-invest with them and ultimately help create more wealth for our people. Um, Kevin, I want to... Add Backtrack a bit, you also have a foundation uh, that you started and you're specifically focusing on financial literacy and running educational programs. Now, when you're thinking about the type of impact you want to make in a community, there's so many things that you could do, right? Um, why particularly financial literacy and why particularly education? So financial health is just one component of the foundation. It's really about mentorship and it's about our future, right? Our children are our future and I understand that me being an athlete, I have the biggest impact on the following generation, right? So if I can continue to rally them and get them to understand that um, not only does literacy and financial literacy have to be a part of our culture, but it has to be a part of our religion. It, ha it has to be something that we understand and we commit to and we start to look at it in a sense of this is who we are, right? Because there are a lot of other communities that look at their finances as, you know, a part of them. So for us, we've kind of, you know, in generations to come have been um, distracted from what really matters. So for me, uh, starting with the kids and when you talk about programs um, in the States, we have a program with Chase Bank who um, gives us a lot of support in teaching our uh, younger generations about the saving, uh, budgeting, and the different things that just goes into what you'll need to succeed. Okay. All right. Um, 
So in terms of programs, what does that look like? Is it, um, a, 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 you know, because mentorship is such a, I think, organic process as well. Is this uh, a, a weekly program? Is this a monthly program? What, is, what does it actually look like? Well, the biggest thing for me, you know, I'm from Los Angeles and then I got drafted to New York, which are the two uh, biggest thriving cities um, in America. Um, and we've been able to not only sustain in the middle school and high school, so grade school from anywhere from 10 years old to 18 years old, giving them um, just private tours and giving them different mentors in the finance space. So a guy like Kai will come in every week and give um, different presentations about the different things, you know, from the level from, like I say, investing, budgeting, saving that kids need to know, right? And they, he kind of slows it down so that it becomes something that's innate within them. So, you know, you have third graders learn about budgeting and things that, you know, we didn't get to back in my time. Uh, Kai, let's go back to the relationship between investment and sport. Um, you've helped over 100 athletes to invest in tech. Um, you know, talk a little bit about why you th what opportunity you had identified there, why tech specifically, uh, where do you think is the unique, uh, you know, integration between tech and sport? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, one interesting thing that, we, you know, we started doing is we started, um, you know, investing in sports teams, right? So, like, if anybody watched, the NBA just changed their collective bargaining agreement to where current players can actually invest in other teams. And the reason that that's important is, number one, there are no black-owned teams. But as I think about sports team ownership, let's, you know, let's just take this bottle of water, for example. If Kayvon and I invest in a water company, but we also own you know, a piece of a sports franchise, best believe we're going to have a conversation about putting that water into the stadium, right? So I think when you think about it from that lens, it's really an incubation center for the investments that we're looking at. And I think that when you look at, you know, just venture capital in general, right, like that, those are where the outside returns are. The challenge is that 99% of athletes across the league don't have a structure around them to consistently vet diligence and invest and access uh, the best deals, right? So like LeBron James is gonna be fine, right? Steph Curry is gonna be fine, right? The big Tom Brady, all of those guys are gonna be fine. But what if you're the 11th guy on the basketball team, you're still making two to three million dollars a year? Or what if you're not a starter on the football team? How do you get access to, like how do you get access to the top deals, right? So for me, what I tell all of my guys is hold me accountable because my goal is to try to make you more money off the court field or stage than you made on the court field or stage. And yourself, Kevin, I mean, when you're having a venture fund, you're bringing more to the table than just a financial capital. When you think about yourself, the mindset that you have and the discipline you have as an athlete, what do you think you bring to the table, um, to the pool of uh, startups that you're going to set out to invest in? Of, when he speaks of LeBron James, you know, I think he's one person who kind of is the exemplar of what we're trying to um, continue, right? He always talks about being more than an athlete. And when you look at these venture capital deals, when you look at uh, a, a situation, an event like we're at, you have to be more than an athlete to get people to hear your story, right? Because we are so enclosed and we, we, so much of our time is dedicated to our sport or to our um, job that we kind of lose sight of the grand picture, right? For me, I'm 22, but I only end up playing football, God willing, 10 more years, right? And I still have the rest of my life to live. So I try to get guys understanding early in their career that if they use all the money that they're making with the mindset of what they're gonna do um, once they're done, they can continue to grow wealth and not have to downsize their lifestyle once it's over, because it only lasts so long. So for me, I try to educate my guys, and Kai is one person who's a testament to knowledge is free. You know, uh, one thing that a lot of famous celebrities, they, they forget is that the power is in the leverage, right? When you talk about leverage, me being a celebrity or being a professional athlete gives me access, so I need to use it, right? Uh, the, the smartphone is only as smart as the user, right? So we have to kind of understand that, you know, my time is now, and the window that I have is so small that I have to use it and monopolize it, and, you know, just to continue to educate guys and get them kind of thinking on the right path. Yeah. Thing. How's that influencing your lifestyle? Um, I would assume as an athlete, there's just a certain way that you move, whether it's entertainment, lifestyle. How is this new field that you're also looking into, the investment field, the venture fund field, how's that influencing the way you approach your life in terms of your lifestyle? 
I, I think the biggest word that I think everybody should take from this is just longevity. You know, it's just understanding that everything you do today is what you're going to see tomorrow, right? So for me, I try to really live that and understand that, you know, you can't really fake it. There's no way around it. There is no gimmicks. You have to kind of put in the work today so that, you know, you'll, you'll reap the benefits tomorrow. Okay. Add to that, right? Like, one, one thing we do is we, we try to bring groups of athletes and entertainers to connect directly with with billionaires and, and multi-generational families because they have the blueprint to do it. We were literally just talking backstage, right? Like, there are not too many second generation billionaire black people in the world, let alone the United States, right? In the States, we're still learning the current, like the currency of capital, right? So when you think about, it, it's one thing to attain the wealth, but then it's harder to keep it, right? Especially when you have so many people that are dependent on, you know, your ecosystem is dependent on you, right? So I think that one thing that we always try to do is connect them with people who have actually done it. And that becomes really powerful because not only do they have access to the best deals, they can literally give us the blueprint on how to make the wealth last for 50 years, 100 years, 200 years. I mean, let's, let's face it, like we were also talking backstage, right, about like redlining. Right, like in the States, redlining was huge because basically black people were prevented from you know, access to, to capital, access to credit, and access to homes. That same redlining is happening in tech right now, except the difference is it can set you back 200 years in one generation instead of 10 to 25, right? So we try to have these conversations and, and having conversations like, the, like that are important um, because it's, it's not impossible. Right? I think Jay-Z said, difficult takes a day, impossible takes a week. But we're trying to think about 100 years from now, right? So when you have this group mindset and, and the access to the network, that's re really what will take people there. Okay. On the floor for us, uh, one to two questions. So whilst we get a tech team, I don't know if you have a roving mic, if there's anybody in the audience with a question. I see you, sir. Uh, do we have any other question? Okay. Two, second, three. Okay, three questions. We'll Pause it there. Whilst we get a roving mic to the audience tech team, uh, let me ask you this, Kai. What do you look into when you're identifying uh, sports talent to work with to potentially invest in tech ventures? You've got a brilliant young man here in Botswana. Uh, his name is Liti Leteboho, and um, he's the world 100 meter record holder for the under 20. And I think you definitely should not leave the country before you meet him. I don't know if he's in the country himself, but that's possibly somebody you, that you, you got should to look connect. Into. Can you plug me with him? <laughs> I'm sure there's okay. somebody in the room who can connect um, you. But what do you look into when you want to, you know, uh, work with sports talent? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing is, is, is two things. Number one, you, you got to be clean, right? Like, you got to have a strong reputation off the field or off the court or off the stage. The other thing, though, is do you want to learn and, and what is the overall value proposition, right? So, like, from a general standpoint, if you look in our investment documents, it's a very large minimum investment required for me to invest your money. But I don't really worry about that when it comes to athletes and entertainers because if you're going to, for example, I have somebody that put 50K with me, but he introduced me to six teammates, gives me tickets to the games, can connect me with his team owner. That's the type of value that's interesting to us because now we're building an ecosystem and it's not just a one-off transaction, right? So that's, that's what we look for. So we can start with you, sir. Am I on? Yeah. My name is Jame Bansi, popularly known as Zeus. I'm a recording and performing artist from DIY Entertainment. Um, huge sports fan as well, huge basketball fan. <laughs> oh, hashtag playoff mode, right? Um, so as she rightly pointed to, we've got a lot of budding talent, a lot of very interesting codes. Athletics is top of the list when it comes to the kind of international success we've seen. But where is the starting point? Because it's very interesting that you guys have like a, a, a VC approach to sports development. Most of Africa has um, a public sector, private sector sponsorship approach, you know. And I think it's mainly driven by the fact that, you know, we haven't really figured out uh, uh, the metrics that will attract you know, investment and the like. So what would you suggest in terms of building frameworks around that? And then two, March Madness was just yesterday. You talked about it coming from Villanova. You know, the building of equity starting with uh, school sports, starting with uh, varsity sports and the like. Um, and down to even now, the social space. 
you know, out here we've seen the explosion of Sunday soccer, for instance. I mean, it's like pickup league vibes, right? I mean, even now, your ice cubes, three on three league and the like. How do you see those types of spaces coexisting with, um, you know, mainstream uh, leagues like the NBA? I'll try to answer both um, at the same time, right? Like, ultimately, it's hard to be what you can't see, and it's hard to access what you don't know exists, right? So part of, you know, the reason that it's important for athletes and entertainers to do things like Kayvon does in terms of giving back is because you're going to influence the next generation, and you have so many eyes on you that that impact when you come together with a group of 50, 60 athletes and entertainers, that type of visibility and those types of eyes is actually extremely influential on a global scale, right? So one thing that we would like to do is next year when we come back for the Africa Summit is to bring a group of athletes and entertainers, right? So now it becomes the cool thing to do to come to Africa, see the land, get to connect with people. You, you see what I'm saying? So like creating the vibe around, like making it cool is literally what the United States has capitalized off of you know, the, you know, the culture in, in the States, right? So how do, we, how do we make it cool to come back to Africa and talk to the founders here? How do we make it cool to come speak on stage? How do we create a vibe around doing things like this and educating everybody? Because ultimately that's going to bridge the gap and open the door. So hope, hopefully I answered. I don't know if you want to add anything to it. but on the nose it's really just about unity and courage right because they have the infrastructure and they've already done it right so now when we see these franchises like the nba like the nfl they already have one the resources and two the the stance behind it so i think we have the talent we have everything that makes it go we just got to believe in ourselves and go do it cool yes sir uh, good afternoon. Uh, so I'm Velani Mboweni. I'm from Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, I'm a tech founder as well. Uh, I just wanted to ask you a few quick questions, uh, Kai, if, you, if you'd indulge me for a minute. Uh, you mentioned your fund and everything you're working on. Um, is it primarily, um, let's call it financially driven, or is there an impact component uh, from the deal flow side? Uh, and secondly, on that, if it is financial and impact, what are some of the key metrics you're looking for? Is it you know, SDG aligned? Is it about lifting people out of poverty below $5 a day? What is that uh, flow? Especially because you mentioned that your fund is not just US-based, but it's looking at international components. And then maybe the second component to, to, to Kayvon is, you know, beyond just sports and entertainers, is it just going to focus on NFL and NBA, or what is your scale and vision for this uh, limit, li limitless ventures approach? Is it going to, you know, flow into UEFA Champions League? Is it going to flow into rugby? What, what's the big play? Because I really back that view about unity. But, you know, what's your path to scale as the supply side of the capital? Thanks. First of all, great question. Thank you for asking me what we invest in and about the thesis. Because it's funny, when you're a VC and people have a company, they just come up to you and start pitching out of nowhere. Um, I'll, try <laughs> um, I'll answer the last one first, right? From a scaling perspective, it's funny. There are, in terms of quantity, I think we have about 85 athletes and entertainers that invest with us. Most of the capital is actually from family offices, right? So from a scaling perspective, it's how do we use group economics from the athlete, entertainer, influencer community to co-invest with the billionaire families of the world into the best deal flow? You know, uh, quick segue, post George Floyd in the States, there were a lot of venture firms, we were talking about this backstage as well, there were a lot of venture firms that were created to where the thesis and the mandate was how do, you know, minorities get capital from minority-led funds. That attacks one side, of the, one side of the equation, right? Black founders, minority founders, women founders, all need more capital. The other side of it, though, is how do we create wealth by getting access to the deals that are made the winners, right? In Silicon Valley and tech, the winners are made. It's not by mistake that these companies are worth $10 billion. So while we definitely need to move capital to the founders, we also need to get the capital that we've already made into the deals that are going to help us make 10, 20, 30 times our money so that we don't have to go ask a VC for, for startup capital, right? Like, typically, our friends and family round is very little. It's, it's, it's small. Right? So how do we create wealth in the community? That's the, the, that's the part of the challenge that 
I try to attack that I don't think a lot of VCs have seen. So trying to answer you know, all of your questions, but again, from a scaling perspective is how do we use group economics and come together, learn the game, and invest with the best, then try to use that capital and that influence internationally to say, hey, we've created the model already. How do we copy and paste it across Africa? Right? How do we connect with the ecosystem? How do we invest with the biggest investors here to create wealth? educate people on how venture capital works, how to build these relationships, how to get into those ecosystems. And then, you know, that's, that's the plan, so. Hello. To add to that, one problem that I realized that we face in the black community in America is that we don't control anything, right, as far as our food, as far as our education, as far as our health care. So for us, I think that'll be a big piece, and that is a big piece of what we want to do. We want to kind of take back control of our communities and start kind of feeding our minds and changing what we do, what we think, and how we are, you know, amongst ourselves. And when you look at, for me, the athlete space, right, you think in a, on a football team there's 53 guys. To each guy, they're signed to a different company. None of these companies are black, right? So you talk about taking a piece of their wealth. Each athlete is getting a piece of their wealth taken from them, right, every year. So you imagine if we were able to not only, well, when you look at the NFL alone, right, not just the NBA, but the NFL makes $17 billion a year, right? Half of that is split with the owners, right? So if there are 32 teams, imagine how many owners there are. 32, right? And when you talk about football players, they're about... 1,500 football players per year that go through. So we're splitting another nine billion. Well, if we brought that nine billion together into a fund, we'll be able to control our health care in each you know, respective community. And I think that's the goal. I think we had, was it you? It wasn't you. There was a gentleman there. Let's. I'll wait, I'll wait, I'll wait. <laughs> okay. I'll wait, I'll wait. No, we've got, you, you can ask, we've got a few minutes for both questions, so that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I haven't forgotten you. Yeah, okay, cool. So yeah, um, first and foremost, my name's Kevin Dennison. I'm from Philly. Um, uh, man, I'm a fan of both you guys. T I'm from West Philly, man. Yeah, Villanova's right up the street from me. Oh, you can't hear me. Sorry. My name's Kevin Dennison. Um, I work in the federal uh, contracting space. Um, you know, I was telling these guys I'm from Philadelphia. Um, so my question is for Tibbs. Um, it's more so on the ethics part, right? So you guys, it's, it's great what you guys are doing, right? You're 22 or 23. Um, man, so how do you bridge that gap? How do you bring financial literacy back to L.A., right? You got these guys coming out of USC, uh, UCLA. You got guys coming out of Oregon that are going to be hitting it big, and they're going to get big contracts, right? So how do you, um, you know, plan to you know, bridge that gap and preach that, that financial literacy because you're off to a great start? One piece when you talk about financial literacy. So if you guys may not know, there was recently a bill passed. It's called, it's NIL, right? Name, image, and likeness. So now uh, college sports allow athletes to basically make revenue off of their name, their image, and their likeness, right? Yeah, shout out to that. Um, so for me, I was the first athlete or one of the first athletes, this happened two years ago right after COVID, um, to monopolize that and to, you know, make a lot of money, right? So I was able to really um, kind of take over in that space. And when you talk about what we're going to do and what we've been doing, we've been aligning because a big thing right now in America is cool to be black, right? It's cool to be a part of the culture. So I have been kind of teaching athletes how to believe in themselves and realize that these big companies are going to pay you regardless, right? And obviously you have to be clean. You have to align yourself with the companies that you want to represent. But it's understanding that there's a business side to it and then uh, aside from the sports. So now with NIL, right, um, my, my biggest thing is how can I represent myself, right? Because the same things that these companies that I was saying before are taking pieces of, all we have to do is get the knowledge. So for me, I was a guy who was a, a trailblazer of that, right? So I did my own deals in college. I made upwards of 500000 which wasn't a, it was a lot back then, but it's definitely not a lot now. Guys are making millions. But I think it's just the understanding and kind of creating that culture around, like, you can do it, right? And I know it sounds so cliche, but a lot of athletes, we get put in this box, right? When I, when I come here, everybody's looking at me like, oh, look at that cool football player. But I came here today to be a businessman, and that's how I want to leave here. So that, <laughs> thank you. But I think that's, that's really the main point, just to get athletes to understand that they have power and leverage and power and knowledge and power in themselves. Yeah. yeah. To, to add to that, right, like, what's the Beyonce lyric where she says, pay me in equity, right? Like, that's the next step of that, 
right? So, you know, it's, 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 it's one thing, it's very challenging, you know, just to answer your question, right, to sit across from an 18-year-old kid who's about to come into millions of dollars and tell him not to spend any of his money, right? Like, I buy a pair of Jordans every week, so I can't tell a young kid not to do that. But what I can also help him understand is that he can look at that sneaker as if it were a stock. Or he can look at that sneaker, buy, if you're gonna go buy a pair of Jordans, go buy Nike stock as well, right? You, you see what I'm saying? So like, educating the athlete, again, going back to what we were saying earlier, using things that they understand is the quickest way to close the knowledge gap. <laughs> to, to finish that, I always tell them, would you rather be a mascot or a partner? Just remember that. Yes, sir. Yeah, last question. My name is Peggy Kunene. I come from a company called Mindtrix Digital, based in South Africa. I am also a Forbes lister for the 2015 Forbes 30 Under 30. Um, and yeah, my, my, my question is really is all about the information that you kind of have shared. I think you break it down into a very simple way of saying, look, um, you bring financial literacy to these guys in a very simplified manner. And for me, I had to read all these books, you know, just to kind of understand what it is I was doing because I started a company with 600 rands in my bedroom. But now I've been able to scale it to a global level where I can work with companies all around um, Africa doing various, um, you know, digital work and tech work that basically answers to all of these clients' business objectives. So every kind of project we work on is really towards or geared towards, um, you know, each company's business objectives. So it's not just campaigns or digital tech work. We, we're answering a problem. Um, but what happens when I reach a ceiling? Because I remember in 2015, it was like we're 30 under 30 future African billionaires. Uh, but now I get to a million and I'm like, I don't know what happens after this. How do I get to information that you know? Or how do I get to networks that where you're discussing the next big thing because my network only speaks of things that are of this um, you know, level. So I think what happens when I hit the ceiling, and I don't want to come to you and say, I want to pitch. I want to come to you and say, can I get to listen to what you guys talk about so that I can also have the understanding that is on the next floor? Because I think I'm on this floor, but I've reached a ceiling. Thank you very much. It's funny. Uh, I'm going to let Kai answer your question, but I just want to give you a small story. Um, I was with my girlfriend, and we were at this comedy club, and I looked around, and I realized that I was probably the richest guy in there, and I knew to never go back, right? <laughs> that was my understanding, and me and Kai laughed behind stage, but it's like now we're in a position where we are the poorest guys here, and we're excited about it, right? So that's where we go and feed that knowledge and not be afraid for that. Um, yeah, I would, just to piggyback, I would actually say not to think like that, right? That's a very limiting mindset, right? And I think there's a number of socioeconomic factors that contribute to why we may think that there is a ceiling. There is no ceiling. There's no cap. There's no limit to what you can do. And I think that a lot of times we have to tell ourselves that there is no limit to what you can do, right? Like, in my mind, I can still be a billionaire. Now, statistically, whether it's going to happen or not is, is up for grabs, but I wouldn't limit myself and say I can't, or how do I do that, right? Like, you're already doing it right now. Like, you're in the right room. You're at the Forbes 30 Under 30 Africa Summit, right? So, like, that's, that's how you put yourself in these rooms. You think about creative ways to connect, right? Like, one thing that could be interesting is, like, if you have a company, how could you partner with Kayvon, right? Like, how do we work out some sort of equity package or some investment package to where it's not only him, but it's 30 athletes instead of just Kayvon? Now, collectively, you got a bunch of eyes, you got a bunch of influence, you got a bunch of, you know, you have a bigger network because you thought creatively about how to use the group as opposed to using one athlete. So that's just one example at the top of my head. To go to what Kai is saying is think outside the box. You know, coming here, you never understand, you never really realize who could help you, you know, get that leverage that you need. You never really realize, you know, who you can meet that'll help you kind of catapult where you are. As long as you just remember to always make it mutually beneficial, I think you'll always continue to grow. Gentlemen, uh, <laughs> time is up. <laughs> 30 seconds, your last words. I just want to finish with this was my first time coming to Africa, being in Botswana. Oh, wow. Yeah, oh, wow. so yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's actually really dope. Um, <laughs> hey, and the cool thing is, awesome. you know, be, being from America, you don't really know, you know, where you're from. Like, I'm a descendant of slave, but I just took the DNA test and I just found out I'm Nigerian. So I'm happy, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy about that. Oh, wow. and I'm going to go visit that soon.
Thank you. I thought you were going to say uh, Motswana. <laughs> Thank you very ladies and gentlemen for joining us on this panel.